Hello, hello, and welcome. My name is Mini Betrayal, and this is a Factorio tutorial: circuits and circuit networks. Now, before the length of this video frightens you off, you should know that this video is not necessarily meant to be viewed all at once or even in order. I'll be covering everything from the absolute basics for those who have never touched the circuit network before, right up to some worked examples of common builds. At any time, feel free to check the video description where I'll post timestamps to each part of the video. Skip forward, back, however you please, based on what you'd like to learn. Or watch the video all at once, I'm not the police. Factorio can be quite daunting at times, especially if you're new to the game and see some of the massively complex mega bases and intricate builds that some people share on YouTube, Reddit and the like. Arguably, one of the most complex parts of the game is the circuit network. But like an entire language that's built from just a few letters arranged in increasing layers, even the most convoluted circuit builds are built on a few relatively simple rules, which I'll aim to share with you in this video. In the latter part of the video, there are a number of worked examples, and I'll post a link to a blueprint book containing blueprints of each of the examples I show you. This is the first time I've tried making a video quite like this, and I've tried to make things as easy to follow as I can. But if you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below and I'll answer them if I can. If I get enough questions, I may post a follow-up video, and if there's enough interest, I may do other similar videos on other topics within Factorio. Enjoy! Let's start off with the research. The circuit network research can be completed relatively early in the game, with the only prerequisite being Electronics 1, and costing just a hundred of each science packs 1 and 2. Once completed, this will unlock two types of wire, coloured red and green, three types of combinator, called arithmetic or arithmetic, a decider and a constant, a power switch, and a programmable speaker. These can each be combined with each other and other in-game in entities to perform all sorts of computations and functions, from simple commands like switching off production of a given item once you have a stockpile built up, to vastly more complex tasks like entire working computers within the game. Now let's continue by looking at the materials that the research allows us access to. We first have the two kinds of wire, red and green. Both take the same parts to craft, a copper cable and an electronic circuit, and they're both used to carry signals from one place to another. A single cable can reach over shorter distances, for example from a box to an inserter, but several cables can be hooked up via any of the three types of power poles to transmit signals over a much longer distance, even from one side of the map to the other. So why are there two colours of cable, and what's the difference between them? The simple answer is that there is no difference, and either can be used for any task the other could also be used for. The reason for having two colours comes down to the fact that sometimes you want to carry two different signals along the same path, and by sending one signal down each of the coloured cables, you can avoid cross-contamination of those signals. Now, I can't progress much further without talking about what kind of signals you can send across a wire, and how they interact with each other. Factorio includes a large number of different signals based on the in-game items, plus numbers, an alphabet, and some simple colours. The easiest way to see this in action is to use a cable, of either colour, to connect a chest to a power pole. If you then place any item in the chest, you can then mouse over the power pole to see what is being carried along the wire. Here, you can see that the wire is carrying a signal of one iron plate. If I place another plate in the chest, the signal changes to two iron plate. If I place a copper plate in the same chest, the cable now carries a signal of two iron plate and one copper plate. You'll notice that the signals on the power pole have a red background. This is because the signals are being carried by the red wire. If I now place a second chest and connect it to the same pole with a green wire, and then move the copper plate to the second chest, and check the power pole, you can now see that the signal of two iron plates still has the red background, but the copper plate has a green background, indicating it's being carried by the green wire. I'll now demonstrate how the two colours of cable can be used to transmit signals together by adding a third chest, hooked to the pole with the red wire. If I put another iron plate in this chest and check the pole, you can see that the contents of the two chests are added together. Two iron plates plus one iron plate is three iron plates. 
This is because like signals of the same colour wire are added together. If I take that third iron plate and put it in the second chest, that is the one with the green wire, you can see that this plate has been added to the green signals with the copper plate, and is therefore not mixed with the other iron plates on the red wire. It's also worth mentioning that the chests do not need to be connected directly to the power pole. Signals are added together along the entire length of the wire, so if chests are connected like this, from chest to chest, and then to pole, the same principle still holds. This is the primary use of the two-colour wire system, though most simple circuit networks don't really need two colours, meaning you can simplify things and use only the one colour, which can make things look a little neater if you like that sort of thing. Alternatively, you can use the colour of the wire to indicate input versus output, or stuff you have versus stuff you need, or anything else you can come up with. Hooking up a chest, or multiple chests, to a power pole is already a very simple network, and is a great way to see how many materials you have in a buffer system, for example, without having to mouse over each chest individually and add them up. Just by checking the connected power pole, you can see at a glance how many iron ore you have in your unloading station, or how many forgotten pistols you have in your storage dumping area. After the wires, we have combinators, and this is where the vast majority of the logic of the circuit network takes place. Firstly, I'll start with the constant combinator, as it is the simplest. It has a connection point to which you can attach a red or a green wire, and I'll hook one up to a power pole now so we can see what it does. When you click on the constant combinator, you're presented with an interface like this, with 15 empty boxes and an on-off toggle. You should note that this tutorial is made with Factorio 0.16, and there is an interface remodel planned for the 0.17 release, so if you're watching this in the future, what you see may be a little different, but I don't expect the general idea will change too much. Now, by clicking on one of the boxes, you're presented with a window like this, which lists every in-game item, including liquids in a separate tab, and another tab just for numbers, letters, and colours. If we select, say, a transport belt to place in this first box, you can see that there is now a slider that allows us to set the number of transport belts, or a box we can set the number directly. If we set the number to 27, and then check our connected power pole, you can see that the wire is carrying a signal of 27 transport belts. In essence, the constant combinator acts exactly like a chest, except that we don't need to physically have the items we want to send along the wire. The constant combinator also comes with another couple of tricks. For example, we can select a fluid to send along the wire as well as a transport belt. While this is technically possible without the combinator, you could hook up a storage tank like you can a chest, it is much easier to set an exact number of fluid with the combinator. The last tab in the combinator allows us to set an abstract number, letter, or colour signal, sometimes known as virtual signals, these are not in-game items, but can be used as extra signals if you need them. They work exactly the same as any other signal. The last trick the constant combinator has up its sleeve is the on-off toggle. If you find yourself in a situation where you no longer want to send your signal along the wire, you could remove each item in the combinator, you could de deconstruct the combinator, or detach it from the network. But if you know you're going to need those same numbers again later, just toggle the switch to the off position, and the combinator will no longer send its signal allowing you to simply switch it back on again, later. Moving on, let's discuss the arithmetic combinator. The first thing to note is that, unlike the constant combinator, the arithmetic combinator needs to be powered, otherwise it's not going to work. Secondly, you'll notice that much like an inserter, it has an in and an out. Pay attention to these, because when you hook up your wires, it's very important to get them connected to the right point, or you'll end up with unexpected results. I'll demonstrate how it works by placing one here, hooking the out end to a power pole so we can see what's going on. I'll hook the in end to a constant combinator, which I'll leave empty for now. Let's click on the arithmetic combinator and discuss what we see. First up, we have two sections, an input and an output. The input section is then split into three parts, with a box here, a box here, and an operator between them. To start, we'll leave the operator as the asterisk, or the star symbol, which means multiplication. When you click on the boxes here, we see something much like the signal selection window we saw with the constant combinator, but with a couple of extra items. 
Firstly, if we look down the bottom, we can set a constant number instead of a signal. For example, if we just want to multiply something by 2, we could choose 2 and set the operator to multiplication. Let's set that second box to a constant of 2 now. Be careful not to select the virtual signal called 2, because that's a different thing. If we now go to the first box, we can select the signal we want to perform our operation on. For example, let's choose the copper plate signal. This means that the combinator will look for copper plate among its inputs, and if it's there, we'll multiply it by 2, and then pass the result to the output. Now that's done, we need to tell the combinator what type of signal to output. We could select copper plate again, but let's choose something different, copper cable. So now, what the combinator should do is to see how many copper plate signals are coming in, multiply it by 2, and output the result as that many copper cables. Effectively a little calculator to tell us how many cables we can make from a given number of plates. Of course, if we mouse over the power pole now, we see nothing, as the arithmetic combinator is not receiving any inputs. So let's go over to the constant combinator and add a signal of one copper plate. If we mouse over the pole now, we can see that we are indeed getting a signal of two copper cables. If you mouse over the arithmetic combinator itself, you can see that the info bar contains sections for input and output signals as well. One copper plate and two copper cables. If we go back to the constant combinator and add another signal, this time an iron plate, we can check that nothing else happens. The arithmetic combinator is only looking for copper plate signals, so it ignores the rest. One copper plate and one iron plate still only outputs two copper cables. This means that the arithmetic combinator can be a good way to isolate one signal from a wire carrying lots. For example, if we have a wire carrying different numbers of each raw resource, and we want to isolate only the uranium ore, for example, we could set the arithmetic combinator to only look for uranium signals, multiply that by 1, and output the result as uranium ore again. This way, it will look for the right signal, multiply it by 1, which of course does nothing to the number, and pass that number on. But what if we want to perform an operation on everything coming down the wire? Do we need to set up a different arithmetic combinator for every possible signal? No, of course not. If we go into the Signals tab of the first input box on the arithmetic combinator, you can see an extra feature here, a little yellow box with a star in it, that, if we mouse over, tells us it is called EACH, and this will perform the operation on each of our input signals. If we do that and check the combinator output now, it's outputting 28 uranium ore. This may seem odd at first, but remember that the output box is still set to uranium ore. So what the combinator is doing is taking each of its inputs, that is, one raw wood, two coal, three stone, and so on, multiplying each of those numbers by one, and then outputting the number, outputting the result as a number of uranium ore. And if you add up one uranium ore, two uranium ore, three uranium ore, and so on, you do indeed get 28. Of course, that's rarely a useful result. Let's say we want the combinator to multiply everything by 2, but still keep the signals separate. This too can be done. First, let's set the constant number to a 2 to perform our correct calculation. Then if we look at the output box, there's an each button here, 2. If we select that and check the result, we have each of our inputs multiplied by 2 as expected. Another thing to mention here is that we can perform operations between two different signals as well. For example, let's put two iron plates and three copper plates in our constant combinator, and say we want the arithmetic combinator to multiply them together, and return the result as a number of steel plates. Instead of selecting a constant number in the second input box, we can just select copper plates instead, and the combinator will perform as expected. Lastly, I'd like to point out that if a combinator receives inputs along both a red and a green wire, any signals that are present on both wires are added together before doing any calculations, though the red and the green values remain separate on the wires themselves. Before moving on, a word of caution, the each button will only look through its inputs for signals that currently exist. 
If we set the combinator to look through each of its inputs and add 1, then output each, we could reasonably expect it to output 3 iron plate and 4 copper plate, as it stands, which it does indeed do. However, note that it does not also output a value of 1 for every other signal, despite every other signal having a value of 0 at the combinator's input. This might seem like a good idea here, but in more complicated setups, you may not realise that you're losing information because a value of 0 is not being correctly passed on. The arithmetic combinator gives us access to 11 different operations – multiply, divide, add, subtract, modulo and power, and five other operators called bitwise operators, which I will get to in a moment. I'd like to think that anyone capable of playing Factorio can understand what multiply, add and subtract do, but it's worth spending a little time covering modulo, power and, perhaps surprisingly, divide. I'll start with power, represented by the caret symbol, or the little up pointing arrow, usually above the number 6 on your computer. One number raised to the power of another is multiplying the first number by itself by the second number of times. For example, 3 to the power of 4 is the same as 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Most often, you'd raise a, power, you'd raise a number to the power of 2, or square it, which is the same as multiplying a number by itself. There's a vast number of online resources you can read up on if you want to learn more about powers, or exponentiation, as it can also be called. Next, dividing. Now, some divisions in Factorio will be exactly what you expect. 10 divided by 5? 2. 21 divided by 3? 7. 11 divided by 2? 5. Wait, what? It turns out that Factorio employs something known as integer division. In fact, all numbers in Factorio circuits are integers, that is to say, a whole number, which means you can't have a half or a quarter or any fraction of a circuit value. So to understand what's going on here, we have to look back to how we first learned to divide numbers at school, when they didn't divide evenly. If you take the number 11 and divide it by 2, yes, you could say that the answer is 5 and a half, but you can also say that the answer is 5 with 1 left over or 13 divided by 5 is 2, with 3 left over. What well, integer division is like this, except the leftover part is ignored, and you just get the whole number part spat out as your answer. So 6 divided by 3 is 2, 7 divided by 3 is 2, 8 divided by 3 is 2, 9 divided by 3 is 3. But what happens to that extra part? What happens if we need a more accurate calculation? Well, this is where the, our other operator comes in, modulo, represented by the percent symbol. Modulo is also a division operator, except that this one ignores the whole number part and just returns the remainder, or the leftover part of the calculation. So while 13 divided by 5 is 2, 13 modulo 5 is 3, the bit left over when 13 is divided by 5. For example, 6 modulo 3 is 0, 7 modulo 3 is 1, 8 modulo 3 is 2, 9 modulo 3 is 0. Once again, there are countless online resources you can use to learn about what the modulo operator does and how it works. Now you know that what it is and have a basic understanding of it. Factorio's arithmetic combinator also includes five so-called bitwise operations for you to choose from. I'll include a short description of them here for completeness, but I will be the first to admit that while I understand how they work, I'm not the best person to explain why you might want to use them. To understand these, you first need to know how binary numbers work. As with other operators, there are countless resources you can find online to learn how binary numbers work, but as a quick introduction, Binary is a counting system that only uses ones and zeros. Without going into details, ordinary counting is base 10, which means if you look at a number from right to left, you have a ones column and a tens column, then a hundreds, thousands, and so on. Or you have a column of 10 to the power of 0, which is 1, then 10 to the power of 1, which is 10, then 10 to the power of 2, then to the power of 3, etc. 
binary is a base 2 counting system. So you have a column for 2 to the power of 0, then 2 to the power of 1, then to the power of 3, 4, etc. Or a 1's column, a 2's column, 4's, 8's, 16's, 32's, etc. On the display here you see an 8 digit binary number, 11010011. If you add up all the digits in their places, you have 1's in the 1, 2, 16, 32 and 64's column, which all added together is 211, which is what this number represents. We now have enough to investigate the first two operations, which are called bit shifts. These are represented by two arrows to the left and two to the right for a bitwise left and right shift respectively. Shifting to the left simply moves each one in the binary number a given number of places to the left and adds zeros on the end. So shifting our number to the left by one place gives us 11010011, which is 422. By two places, 11010011100 or 844. Notice that each shift left is equivalent to multiplying by 2. Similarly, shifting to the right discards what is ever in the right hand column and moves each digit a place to the right. So if we take our original number and shift once to the right, we get 1101001 or 105. Shifting again is 52 and a third time is 26. Similarly, this is like dividing by 2 using the integer division we discussed earlier, where you ignore any fraction. The last three bitwise operators require us to have another binary number we can work with. Let's choose 101010010, which is 170 as a normal number. The AND operator looks at each binary place, and the result has a 1 in that place, if and only if there is a 1 in both of the input numbers. If either number or both of them have a 0 in that place, then the result also has a 0 in that place. So in this case, our result is 10000010, which is 130. The OR operator is similar, but is more lenient, so to speak. The result has a 1 in a given place if either one of the input numbers or both has a 1 in that place. So this time our result is 11111011 which is 251. The XOR operator or exclusive OR operator places a 1 in the result if one but not both of the input numbers has a 1 in the given place. This time our result is 0111001 or 121 as a normal number. Let's now move on to the last combinator in our selection, the decider combinator. Whereas the arithmetic combinator is great for performing calculations, the decider is used for deciding things. This combinator also needs power, so let's pop one down and hook it up to a constant combinator to see what we can do with it. Note that, as with the arithmetic combinator, there is a distinct input and output. Clicking on the combinator, we see a window similar to that of the arithmetic combinator. There's an input and an output section, the input section with two boxes to select signals from, and a box to choose the output signal. We also have a list of relations, and a selection next to the output box. The way the decider combinator works is to evaluate a condition between two inputs, and then if that condition is true, send an output. For example, let's go to our constant combinator and put in two iron plate and three copper plate to send to the decider. Then let's choose iron and copper plates for the two input boxes in the decider combinator itself. We need to choose an output, so let's set the output box to steel plate and click the selection for one rather than input count. The default selection for the relationship is the less than relationship, which is an arrow pointing to the left. So the decider is currently asking the question, is the value of the iron plate signal less than the value of the copper plate signal? Since iron plate is 2 and copper plate is 3, the answer is yes. So the combinator proceeds to the output section and outputs one steel plate. 
If we leave everything else the same but swap around the iron and copper plates, the question is now, is the value of the copper plate signal less than the value of the iron plate signal? The answer is no, so no steel plate is output. If we add some steel plate into the constant combinator as well, we can see what else the output can do. Let's also switch the iron and copper plates around again so that the answer to our relation is yes again. Now, four steel plate is now also being passed to the decider combinator. This is not used for the relationship evaluation, but we can now select input count in the output section, which, which means that when the output is sent onwards, instead of just one steel plate, we'll get whatever is being put into it. In this case, four. If we now look at the extra tab in one of the input boxes, we can see that there are a few sp special symbols in here too. First we'll discuss the yellow each symbol that we've seen before. Set up the combinator to each on the left and the constant number 10 on the right, and we'll toggle the output selection back to 1. Let's have a look at what we get. So what's the question here? For each input item, is it less than 10? If it is, output one steel plate. We have three input items, copper, iron and steel, all of which are less than 10, so the combinator outputs one steel plate for each of them, three in total. If we add another item, say 20 plastic bars to the constant combinator, we still only have three steel being output, because the value of the plastic bar signal is not less than 10. Going back to the decider combinator, we have another two special signals. Next we'll investigate the green anything symbol, so we'll select that and leave everything else the same. The decider combinator now outputs a single steel bar. The question is, does any of the inputs have a value less than 10? The answer is yes, so one steel is output. The last special signal is the red everything symbol. Switching to that, the question becomes, do all of the inputs have a value less than 10? As plastic bars still have a value of 20, the answer is no, so nothing is output from the decider combinator. The anything and everything special signals also have a special case when there is no input at all. If we toggle the constant combinator to the off position, so no signals are supplied to the decider combinator, we can have a look at this. If everything is selected, no matter what the condition is, it is evaluated as true and a steel is output. If anything is selected with no inputs, it is evaluated as false and nothing is output. The decider combinator comes with six different relations to choose from, each used in different cases but all relatively simple. From top to bottom they are greater than, this evaluates to true if the input on the left has a value larger than the input on the right. If the values are equal, the result is false. Less than, this evaluates to true if the input on the left has a value smaller than the input on the right. If the values are equal, the result is false. Equal to. This evaluates to true if the input on the left has the same value as the input on the right. Greater than or equal to. This evaluates to true if the input on the left has a larger value than the input on the right, or the same value as the input on the right. Less than or equal to. This evaluates to true if the input on the left has a value smaller than the input on the right, or the same value as the input on the right. Not equal to. This evaluates to true if both inputs have different values. Moving on from combinators, another thing that's unlocked by the circuit network research is the power switch. This is great for cutting off power to sections of your base to reduce the load on your power plant, or to switch on your steam engines if your accumulators are having trouble taking you through the night. You can use it like this. Identify an area that you'd like to isolate with the power switch and place down the switch. 
The switch itself doesn't need power, but it does need to be reasonably close to your power line, as you need to be able to connect it to the power poles for it to work properly. Now would also be a good time to check the map view and make sure that the area you're trying to isolate doesn't have any other connections to your main power grid. Now, holding copper cable in your hand, click first one and then an adjoining power pole to sever the connection between them. You can also shift click on a power pole to remove all connections if you want. One click to remove power connections, a second click to remove circuit connections. Now with the copper cable in hand, click on one of the severed power poles to attach a copper cable to it, and then click on one side of the power switch. Do the same with the pole with the other pole and the other side of the power switch and you're ready to go. Take the cable out of your hand and click the switch itself to view its controls. You can even do this from right across your base or even the map view. Simply toggle the switch to on when you want power to flow through the switch and off when you don't. Simple as that. The power switch is also one of the in-game objects that can be controlled by a circuit condition, which I will go into a little bit later. The last item unlocked by the circuit network research is the programmable speaker. Now it's possible to do amazing things with the speaker, even program entire songs to be played as you go about growing your factory. An entire video could be dedicated to this one item and how to use it, but I'll give a brief overview here. The speaker needs to be connected to a circuit to work. Then if you click the speaker you'll be shown a window like this, with some settings at the top and a circuit condition below. Starting from the top, you have the volume at which the speaker plays, and then three options. Global playback means that wherever you are on the entire map, you'll be able to hear the speaker as though you were standing right next to it. This is largely a matter of taste, but there are reasons that you may or may not want to hear an alarm going off right on the other side of your base. Next is the Show Alert button. Selecting this will pop up another section for the alert settings, which will allow you to select an icon and a written tag that will pop up on the bottom of your screen where attack notifications and the like normally show, whenever the speaker is played. If the show icon on map button is checked, you can also see the flashing symbol on the map view screen in the location of the speaker. The third option is allow polyphony, or polyphony. If unchecked, only one speaker will be able to play a sound at a time, which may be useful for alarms and alerts, etc. If checked, up to 10 speakers at a time can play their sound, which is great for crafting music. Onto the circuit connection settings, there is a section much like a decider combinator that will ask a question based on the circuit input that will be evaluated to true or false. Whenever the condition is evaluated to true, the speaker will play. You can select different instruments and pitches, or different alarms, or you can tell the speaker to accept the signal value as the pitch of the instrument by clicking the checkbox. Then, lower values of the input signal will trigger lower pitches, and vice versa. Lamps deserve their own section in this video. While separate from the circuit network, they are often used as indicators of various things, or as components of entire displays. When a lamp is placed down, it usually only turns on at night, but if it's connected to a circuit network, it will automatically turn off right away. Clicking on it to show its window reveals that we can now set circuit conditions, much as with a decider combinator, to ask if the lamp should be turned on. For now, I'll set anything greater than zero to make sure that the lamp does get switched on. You can see here that there's also a selection to use colours. Remember the colour signals in the Special Signals tab? You can set the colour of a lamp by using those. As long as the Use Colours button is selected, and the lamp is on, the lamp will display the colour of any colour signal with a value greater than one that it receives. Note that this doesn't work with white, grey or black, but red, green, blue, yellow, magenta or pink, and cyan are all up for grabs. What happens if a lamp receives more than one colour signal? As you can see demonstrated here, colours further left in the list on the Special Signals tab outrank those further to the right. So if a lamp receives both blue and magenta, it'll be blue. If it receives all of the colour signals, it'll be red. At the moment of recording, the actual value of the colour signal has no bearing on the colour of the lamp, 
although I personally hope that the lamps will be changed to instead display the colour signal with the greatest non-zero value. Many other in-game items can also be connected to the circuit network and have different effects when connected. Here follows a brief overview. Transport belts. By default, belts can be enabled or disabled based upon a circuit condition. This is useful to cut resources to an area of a base you don't want to be active. You can also select the belt to read its contents and send that information into the connected network. Pulse will send only a single pulse of information when an item enters the belt, whereas hold will continually send that signal for as long as the item is on that section of belt. Both are useful in different scenarios, and you can also enable both modes of operation to enable the belt and read its contents. Inserters. Inserters can also be enabled or disabled by an incoming circuit condition. If you want the inserter to always be active, you can set the mode of operation to none. Similar to belts, inserters can also read their contents in a pulse or a hold mode when they pick up items. Inserters can also have their maximum stack size set by an incoming signal's value. Additionally, filter inserters and stack filter inserters can have their filters set by non-zero values in the incoming circuit, although be wary of the number of filters an inserter can have. Chests. As shown earlier in the video, chests can send their contents into the connected network. Additionally, requester chests can instead have their requests set by the values on an incoming network. Storage tanks. Similar to chests, a storage tank can be connected to a network and it will send its contents of fluid to that network. Gates. A gate when connected to a wall on at least one side, can be opened by a circuit condition instead of the player. They can also send a chosen signal to the network when the gate detects that it should open. This can be used in combination with rail signals to make safe rail crossings, which I'll get to later. Rail signals. By default, a rail signal will read its current colour and send red, yellow, green, or for a chain signal, blue, into the network although these signals can be reconfigured. Normal rail signals can also be set to red by the circuit, preventing trains from continuing on their path. Train stations. Train stations have four modes of operation, some or all of which can be active at a time. The entire station can be turned off by a circuit condition, which can be useful for directing trains away from old stations or stations that are not ready for a train. The station can also send the circuit contents to the train, which can then have its own conditions, which use the circuit signals to determine how long to wait at that station. The station can also read the cargo contents of the train and send that back into the network, as well as just send a simple signal into the network to indicate when there is a train stopped at the station. By default, that signal is the special T signal, and has the value of the train's ID, which is unique to each train. Accumulator Accumulators can send the amount of charge they have as a percentage into the network. This is useful for determining how much power storage you have, and can be used to trigger emergency power generation procedures if the percentage drops too low. Check the example later in the video. Power switch as discussed earlier, the power switch can also be connected to a circuit network and made to open or close based on a condition. This is how you can automatically connect or sever parts of your base to or from the main power grid. An example of this again will be shown later in the video. Roboports. Roboports have two modes of operation, the logistics network contents or the robot statistics. Read Logistics Network Contents will send the contents of all logistics chests in that logistics network into the circuit. This is much easier than connecting every chest with bits of red or green wire. Alternatively, the RoboPort can send statistics about the number of total and available construction and logistics bots in that network as four different signals. The special signals X, Y, Z and T are used by default, but these can be changed. Mining drills and pump jacks. Both burner mining drills and electric mining drills can be connected to a circuit network. 
They can be enabled or disabled by a circuit condition, but can also read the expected amount of resources available to them, either to an individual miner or the size of the entire ore patch, and send that number to the circuit. This can be a good way of automatically performing some kind of action when an ore patch runs out. Similarly, pump jacks can also be enabled or disabled, and can read the amount of oil per second they draw from their well. Pumps. Both pumps and offshore pumps can be enabled or disabled by a circuit condition. This is great as it allows us to control the flow of oil fractions to cracking plants to avoid things backing up, which is an example I will show you shortly. The first example today is a counter. So you have a belt, as you see here, with some items on it, and you want to count how many items go past. We know that a belt can read its current contents, but we need a way of remembering that value. We can use a counter for this purpose. I'll set up a decider combinator here, and hook it to one of the belts. I'll then set the belt to read its contents in pulse mode, as I only want to count each item once as it goes by, not once for every game tick it stays on the belt. I can then hook up the output of the decider combinator to its own input. If I then set the combinator to say, if everything is greater than the constant zero, output everything, with input count, we now have our counter. Simple as that. The way this works is that when the combinator receives a pulse from the belt saying an item is present, it passes it through to the output because it's not possible to have a negative or a zero number of items being counted by the belt. The very next game tick, the output is then received again by the combinator's input. So even though the belt is no longer sending a signal, the combinator receives the signal of one iron plate again. And again. And again and again. Effectively, it will remember that one iron plate has passed. When the plate comes around again, there will be an instant where the combinator receives two iron plate signals, one from the belt, and the other from its own output, the previous game tick. So it will pass that signal of two back into itself, and remember the new value of two, and so on. This system works fine, but it does come with a drawback that it can only count up and up, and you can't reset it back to a count of zero without removing and reconstructing it. Luckily, there is an easy way to build this system in such a way that it has a reset switch built in. If I construct a constant combinator over here, with a signal of R for reset in it, and turn it off for now, then go back to the decider combinator, I now only want to count up when R is off, i.e. when we're not resetting the system. So if I change the condition to reflect that, we have if R equals zero, then output everything with the input count. The combinator continues to count passing iron plates as normal, but now if I enable the reset switch, even for a moment, the decider combinator will not pass its input through to its output, and therefore will forget the number it is counted to. The system can also be used to count multiple things at once. If you have a so-called sushi belt with many different items on it, you can use a counter like this to determine how many of each item has passed. Instead of a manual reset switch, like we built here, you could pass a signal to reset the counter after a given amount of time has passed to see how many of each item passes per minute, for example. This leads us nicely into our next example. A common use of circuit networks in Factorio is that of a clock. Now, while such things can be built, I'm not yet talking about a conventional clock with a digital display to tell the time. But what we'll build here is simply a way of telling how much game time has passed. By default, and assuming your base isn't big enough to slow your computer down, Factorio runs at 60 UPS, or 60 updates per second. Each update is called a tick. If you press the F4 key, you can enable the Show FPS option to keep a summary of your frames and updates per second in the top corner as you play. Now, if we were to make a counter that, instead of counting items on a belt, just added one to the total every game tick, we would know that whenever that total reached 60, or a multiple of 60, one real-time second will have passed. We can do that by modifying our last example just a little. Let's set up a decider combinator and a constant combinator as before, but with different values this time. 
We'll put a signal of t equals 1 in the constant combinator, t for time, and connect that to the decider combinator's input, and then onto its output. We want the combinator to keep counting up until a second has passed, at which time it would make sense for the counter to reset itself. So our condition can be, if t is less than 60, output t. t will count up and up and up until t reaches 60, and then it will reset itself back to 0. If I hook up a light to be enabled when t equals 60, you can see it flash once a second, meaning this is working just fine. If you have other things in your factory that need to happen regularly, it need not be once a second. If you need something to happen every minute, you just need to know how many game ticks that is. 60 ticks a second means 1 minute is 3,600 ticks. So if you use that number in your condition, your counter will reset every minute instead. Or you can use 36,000 for every 10 minutes. 30 ticks for every half a second. Anything you like. You can also chain counters together. If I replace my light with another decider combinator set to if t equals 60 output 1t, I can use this as the input for another counter. Because this one will only tick once per second, if I set the condition to the same as the first, to reset when t equals 60, it will reset every minute instead of every second. I could chain another to tick every hour, or go even further if I wanted. Hook them all up to a numerical display, and you have yourself a time-telling clock. The next example is a simple SR latch, or set reset latch. It's designed for when you need a single pulse of information to turn into a steady signal, which can then be reset by a different pulse. The way it works, there are two inputs, a set signal and a reset signal. There are also two outputs, one of which is on, the other of which is off. When the set signal is received, output A will turn on and output B will turn off. If another set signal is received, nothing will change, and the outputs will switch states only when a reset signal is received, and they will remain that way until another set comes along. This is a lot less complicated than it sounds, so hopefully this example will clear things up. The latch is easy to set up. As dummy inputs, I'll put two constant combinators here, both containing a virtual A signal. The top one will be the set, and the bottom will be the reset button. I'll turn them both off for now. The latch itself consists of two decider combinators, both with identical settings. If A equals the constant number 0, then output 1A. Now using red wires, we can connect the output of each combinator to the input of the other. Using green wires, we'll plug in our dummy input switches, and I'll use lights to indicate which output is on. The lights will be connected to the two outputs of the decider combinators, again with green wires, and each have the condition to be enabled when A equals 0. And that's it. If I enable the set switch, we can see that output A is on. If I turn off the switch, A stays on. If I enable the set switch again, no matter how many times, A remains on and B remains off. If I then enable the reset switch, A turns off and B turns on and remains that way no matter how many times the reset switch is turned on. The reasoning for this, and how it works, is a little more complicated, but it's still easy enough to follow through if you consider what each combinator is doing one at a time. Let's assume that the set button is pressed. This sends a signal of A to the top combinator. That combinator will only output if A equals zero, so it doesn't output anything. This means that the top output light turns on, as it's not receiving an A signal. It also means that the bottom combinator is not receiving any input, so the bottom combinator does output an A signal. This will turn off the bottom light, but that A signal will also be fed back into the top combinator. The total input at the top combinator is now two A signals, 
which is still not zero, so it doesn't output anything, and because nothing has changed since the last time we were here, the system is now stable. If we turn the set switch off, the top combinator is no longer receiving a signal from the set switch, but it is still receiving an A signal from the bottom combinator, so its output doesn't change. The bottom combinator is still receiving nothing, so its output doesn't change either. Even though nothing is being input, the system has remembered the state, the outputs haven't changed, and everything is stable. Enabling the set button again doesn't change anything either, as giving the top combinator an A value of 2 as its input still doesn't change anything. Now if we enable the reset switch this time, the bottom combinator gets an A input. Because its A input is no longer 0, it stops outputting an A, switching on the bottom light. However, this also means that the top combinator is now no longer receiving any input, so it begins to output an A signal, turning off the top light and supplying another A signal to the input of the bottom combinator. Even when the reset switch is turned off again, the bottom combinator continues to get the signal from the top combinator, so the outputs don't change, and once again the system is stable back where we started. Over here we can see a similar example, this time being set and reset by transport belts, with their mode set to read contents, rather than with manual switches. You can use just about anything that can output a value to a circuit network instead of manual switches, if you can think of a reason to do so. We'll see an example of it in the very next example. If you've played much Factorio, you've quite possibly come across a situation like this. You have a nice big solar field to power your factory during the day, and a heap of accumulators to store any excess energy for use during the night. But you haven't yet deconstructed your old steam engine setup, because as the factory grows, as it always must, you may need the extra power. But you don't want to have a blackout in the middle of the night after all. How can you get this to work? During the day, the steam engines turn off because the solar panels cover the energy needs of your base, but during the night, the steam engines do all the work while your accumulators sit there doing nothing. You don't want to needlessly pollute and attract biters. That was the point of building solar in the first place, right? But you can't just disconnect the steam engines from the network entirely. You need to be able to connect them again in an emergency, and you don't want to run all the way across your base in the middle of a blackout to reconnect them when you need them most, because, as any seasoned Factorio player will tell you, the middle of a blackout is always when the biters choose to attack. Of course, with the power switch, you can remotely disconnect and reconnect the steam engines from the main power grid, but it wouldn't be the true Factorio way unless you can automate that process, right? Circuit networks to the rescue. An accumulator attached to a circuit network will output its stored energy as a percentage, and we can use this to trigger a power switch to turn on when the charge drops below, say, 20%. But if we try this, you may notice a problem. If I turn the time of day to night so the solar panels turn off, and the accumulator will drain as expected, and the steam engines kind of turn on, but the accumulators don't charge back up. If we check the charge level of the accumulator here and look closely, the percentage is actually flicking between 19 and 20%. Let's have a think about what's going on. The power drops below 20%, so the switch closes. This connects the steam engine, which turn on to power the base and recharge the accumulators. However, once the charge reaches 20%, the switch turns off again, disconnects the steam engine, and the charge drops. This happens very quickly, but it means that the power just flicks back and forth constantly between 19 and 20 percent. We can use an SR latch to solve this. First, we need two decider combinators to turn the charge level of our accumulator into a set and a reset switch. We'll have one to set the system if the charge drops below 20 percent, so the steam engines will connect and recharge the accumulators, but we won't trigger the reset until the charge is done, that is to say, at 100%. So, if we use X as our set-reset signal, and the accumulator outputs charge on the A channel, we want our setting decider to say, if A is less than 20, output 1X. And we want our resetting decider to say, 
if a is equal to 100, output 1x. Then we can build the latch, with both deciders saying if x equals 0, output 1x. And we connect them up with the diagonals as before. Then, if we connect the setting output to the switch, we just need to tell the switch to turn on when x equals 0. If we test this now, we can see that as the charge level A drops below 100, nothing happens with the switch as the system has already been reset. Waiting a little longer, until the charge drops down below 20%, the SR latch is set, the power switch turns on, and this time it stays on until the accumulators are all charged again. When the accumulators all charge up to full, the switch turns off, and the accumulators begin to drain once more. If you wanted, you could combine this idea with a clock, to maybe use a programmable speaker to set off an alarm if the switch stays on too long, or with a counter to, to determine if the engines get connected more than once a night, as either could be an indication that you need to expand your solar fields or accumulators if they're not lasting through the night. Once again, I think it's safe to say that most Factorio players have, at some point, come across the problem where oil refineries all stop working because one of the oil fractions has backed up. There are simpler ways around this, especially once you have already researched cracking, but here is a way you can keep even amounts of all your three oil fractions with just a couple of simple circuit conditions. We could simply spam down chemical plants and crack everything into petrol, and in some cases you want to do just that. But remember, you also need heavy oil to make lubricant, and light oil is the most efficient way of making solid fuel, a step on the way to rocket fuel. By using just a couple of pumps to open or close the pipes to our cracking plants based on how much of each oil fraction we have, we'll never back up, and we'll never run out. What you see here is a situation I've set up to mimic what has happened to me more times than I would like to admit. I've run out of petroleum gas. The refineries have a solid supply of both water and crude oil, but they're not producing because the light oil has nowhere to go. Here's what we can do. I have my heavy oil supply connected directly to my lubricant production. In the grand scheme of things, we don't need that much lubricant, so I expect this to fill up at some point, but that's okay. I have a pump here, between the heavy oil storage and the chemical plants that crack heavy oil to light oil. If I connect that pump to both the heavy oil and the light oil storage tanks, that pump will receive as its inputs how much of each of those oils I have. Now I'd like to keep a little heavy oil on standby in case I run out of lubricant, so let's set that pump to enable only if I have more heavy oil than light oil. Of course at the moment all my heavy oil has been turned into lubricant, so I have less than... I have less heavy oil than light oil, so nothing happens. Let's move on. Similarly, I have a pump here between my light oil storage and the plants cracking light oil to petroleum gas. I can connect that pump to both the light oil and petrol storage tanks, and set it to enable only when I have more light oil than petrol. At the moment, I have no petrol and full light oil, so the pump turns on. We start cracking light oil into petroleum, and now we have space for light oil to go, the refineries turn back on. I've set up a pump to act like a drain for petroleum into my base, so if I go above 20,000 petrol in this case, I'll start using it. With what we've done here, I'll only crack heavy into light, and then light into petrol, if I have more heavy than light, and more light than petrol, respectively. If I wait long enough, the system should stabilise with 20,000 of each oil fraction, and nothing backed up except lubricant, with everything working nicely. Another common use of the circuit network is to give yourself a nice visual display in order to tell how much of a given resource you have in a series of chests. I have here a bunch of chests with different numbers of each basic raw resource. They're already hooked up to a power pole, so I could simply mouse over the pole to see how many of each resource there are but let's see if we can do something a little better. I have over here a series of constant combinators, just acting like labels, so I'm not going to connect them to anything. 
Next to them, let's make a grid of lights. Horizontally, I'll connect them all with red wires, and vertically, I'll connect them all with green wires. You can speed up the process of making a grid like this simply by connecting up one line and then using a blueprint to copy and paste down the rest. As an added bonus, blueprinted wires don't take anything from your inventory, and though while I have a creative mode mod enabled for this example, it'll work just fine with bots too. I'll use the horizontal red wires to carry the actual number of resources from the chests, and the green wires to carry colours. That way I can have low numbers show up as red, medium numbers show up as yellow, and higher numbers come up as green. A different colour of wire is used so that each light only receives one colour at a time to avoid cross-contamination. I'll put combinators at the top with a red, a yellow and a green signal and connect them to the relevant rows. Then I just need to go through each light and set it to be active if the relevant resource is higher than whatever number I choose. Let's say multiples of a thousand. Now this will work, but it means that every single one of these lights has a different condition. So it's going to take a while to set up. Let's see if we can do a bit better. As mentioned before, we can use a combinator to isolate a signal from a bunch of other signals. Let's put an arithmetic combinator over here to isolate a raw resource by adding zero to it. And in this case, let's output an A virtual signal. If we hook up this result to the lights, we then need to switch the condition on the lights to be active if A is greater than 1000, or 2000, 3000, 4000, 5000, etc. The benefit here is that once a single row of lights is done, we can copy the entire row and then paste it over the others. Then just by choosing different settings for the single combinator at the left to isolate a different signal each time, we see our nice coloured display. But once again, we can do a bit better. With this setup, the colour of each lamp is static, it doesn't change. So there are red and yellow lamps in each row, even when that particular resource is all the way full up to green. What if we want the entire row to be its maximum colour? For this, we have to, sp we have to pay special attention to the priority of each different colour. Yellow has the lowest priority, so we'll start here. Let's give everything a default yellow signal by getting rid of our red and green constant combinators and then hooking up the other columns to the yellow combinator as well. The next highest priority of our chosen colours is the green signal. So we want to add a decider combinator that will output a green signal if the total number of input A is above, say, 7000. Red has the highest priority of all, so we need to do this one last. Let's add another decider combinator, this time to output a red signal if the input A is less than 3000. Now each of these combinators needs to be connected to the output of the isolating combinator. Also, the output of these two combinators needs to go into the light grid. If you use the same colours of wire for this, there may be a couple of loops where colours end up getting fed back into the combinators, but because these decider combinators are only ever looking for the A signal, there's no problem with that in this case. So we have one row all done, let's copy and paste. Set the isolating combinators back to their different settings, and we have a nice colourful display that we can use to see at a glance what we have, what we are low on, as well as wondering why we have over 4,000 fish in storage. Our last example today is going to be a safe rail crossing. So the idea being that we can cross the rails here without fear of being hit by a train on the way. Now I'm going to do this one slightly differently. Unlike our other examples, I am actually going to record both video and audio for this one at the same time. So that way you can get an idea of my design process and how I actually think while I'm building this, because I've never actually built one of these before, but I've got a good idea about how I'm going to proceed. Okay, so you can see here I have a loop with a few trains going around just to provide me something to work with. Let's come up here and get started. Okay, so we're going to need a couple of walls, because if you remember our gates, 
um, require a wall at either side, or at least one side, um, in order for us to connect it to the circuit network. So you can see that they will open, um, but at the moment they will open even if there's a train there, so I don't want that to happen, of course. Now if we connect this to the circuit network, we can have a look at their modes of operation. We can either open the gate based on a circuit condition, or we can read um, we can read a circuit coming from the gate if I'm close to the gate or approaching it, and that will output by default a G. The rail signals, oops, rail signal, if I just pop one there, and I'll pop one over here as well. Um, these also have two modes of operation, if I connect that up. Um, we can read their current color, green if it's um, if the next rail block is empty, red if it's occupied, and yellow is going to be uh, a train is planning to cross through that rail signal, i.e. it's too close to break before it gets there. So, um, we only want the gates to open if the rail signal is green. If it's yellow or red, then there either is or is going to be very shortly a train here. So we want the gates to open if and only if green is greater than zero. And we'll copy that same condition onto the gate on the other side as well. And then if I just leave that, you can see as the train goes past, the gates close. And while it's free, the gates are open so I can cross. Now, that is kind of done, but as you saw there, um, the gates closed while I was sort of halfway between them. So we need to be careful about that. So if I'm already there, what I'd like to do is actually stop the trains from coming past. So what I can do here is if I close the signal, if G is greater than zero, then um, whenever I'm close to the gates, this signal here will automatically turn red and will stop any trains going past. So let's try that. Ah, okay, so what we have here is yeah, what we have here is a feedback loop actually, because this one, this gate, is outputting a G because I'm close by, and this signal is therefore closing because it's getting a G. But because it's closing, it's turning red, so it's outputting a red, which comes back to the gate. And because the gate is no longer receiving a green signal, um, it's closing, so I can't get past, and the train can't get past. Not helpful for anyone. Okay, so if we do this slightly differently, if I pop another signal down right there, and hook that up as well, we'll get rid of the close signal on that one, and add it to this one instead. So when G is greater than zero, let's test that. Okay, so the trains can go past, and the gates are open, I can go past, that's fine. If I try and go while a train is running past, it will stop me. Oop. Or, if I am already there when a train tries to go past, the train will stop. So yeah. It was actually a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be, um, but yeah, I, I may use that in some of my upcoming builds. So that's it for this video. I hope you managed to learn something useful. Let me know what you managed to make of what you've learned from here, and most importantly, have fun! In the meantime, I will say thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon.